All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, I'm MC Owens, and this is Dharma Doors. Um, tonight, we're going to continue the looking at the sutra that we started last week. So we are still in the Majima Nikaya, the middle length discourses. We're still going to be on sutta number 43, the Mahavedala Sutra. Uh, the great series of questions and answers. So we started this one last week, <clears throat> and I, you know, I spoke a lot about the the nature of this sutra last week. So I won't do too much of that, but I do just want to remind you that this is one of those sutras where it's actually a conversation between two monks, and there's no Buddha. There's Shariputra. And then this Maha Kuttahita, Kuttahita, and Maha Kuttahita has come to Shariputra with some questions about the Dharma. And I wanted to remind you that this kind of questioning, like the Buddha has already taught the Dharma, and now we have some questions about the Dharma. And that idea of about the Dharma is called Abhidharma. And <clears throat> indeed, the Abhidharma is a whole category of kind of Buddhist literature, Buddhist studies. And it's sort of like deeper, like a deeper dive looking at the Dharma. And that's what's happening in the sutra that we're looking at, which is that Mahakuttahita has these deeper questions about what, what do these things actually mean? So <clears throat> we started and Mahakuttahita, the first question is what's wisdom? What's pranya? And the answer to that was, well, to understand the Four Noble Truths is wisdom, is pranya. Okay, then the next question is, what's consciousness? Now, what we want to notice is, is that there's like a relationship between wisdom and consciousness, which is, well, who or what is aware of this wisdom? So there's a question about consciousness, a question about sensations, vedana, and a, a question about perception, pranya, or samya, sorry. Then the next series of questions were about the mind, about what is knowable by a purified mind, and then things like right view, having the right view as an aspect of a purified mind. So I'm doing a quick review, review of last week, but just to kind of show you that there's like a, a, a logic to this. There's a sequence of ideas that's being laid out. Now, the last idea that we talked about last weekend was about Bahava. Now, Bhava kind of means life or a kind of a being. And so the question was, how many kinds of beings are there? Now, this is a question of like, not like cats versus dogs versus humans versus gods. It's not those kinds of different types of beings. We're not talking about those kinds of beings. No, we were talking just about some like really basic types of being. Being in the realm of desire, <laughs> being in the realm of form, and then being in a formless realm. Those were the three kinds of bhava. Now, the next topic that we're going to talk about tonight, so this is going to be our new topic, Friend, this is Mahakuttahita talking to Shariputra, and he says, friend, what's the first jhana? 
and then we're going to hear about this. So tonight's topic, or at least the first topic tonight, is a jhana. And we might just talk about this all night because there's a lot going on in this. But this idea, of course, we, we talk about a lot in Dharma Doors, but I don't actually know if we've spent sort of just a whole night focused on it. I don't know if we're going to spend all of tonight looking at this, but this is just this first jahanya. And now that idea of a janya, well, there's a lot of connection actually between Mahakotahita's last question about the types of bhava and then this idea of being in a jhana. So first off, let's kind of define our terms. So as you know, a jhana is a, it's a very specific meditative state. And so the first thing that I kind of want to make it clear is that a jhana is, it's not a verb. You, you don't do jhana. A jhana is sort of like, well, I guess you could call it a state of being or a state of mind. You could call it a meditative state. You could call it a meditative absorption, which is the language that's often used. Now, the thing that I want to kind of put out there, though, is what you do, though, like the verb the verb that is involved in a jhana or a jhanic state, you abide in a jhana. So there's this language in Buddhism of abiding. You know, it, it, to put it like colloquially, it's like hanging out. But it's that idea of kind of being in a particular state. Now, the question here is a very specific pointed question. What is the first jhana? Now, well, I guess we could kind of get into it. Yeah, we don't need to go too deep. I want to remind you really quickly, though, because not everybody probably knows this. I think all of you do, though. So this is a very old word, this the idea of a jhana. And that old word, Pali word, it becomes this Sanskrit word, dhyana, with like a D, a hard D. And dhyana has slightly different connotations than jhana in that way. But then what I just kind of want you to know really quickly is that this word, jhana, which becomes dhyana, when it idea with the the idea that we're going to talk about when it eventually travels to china the chinese translate this as chana so jana to jana to chana so a transliteration and then that transliterated chinese pronunciation of chana well that's two characters, two ideograms, two uh, kanji, if you're thinking of Japanese. And what happens is, is that the chan, a, uh, chana, they eventually drop the second character that is just the, the sound, a. Uh, and that just leaves this chan, no more, a, uh, just chan. And then that character goes to Japan where they pronounce it Zen. And I just like to draw that connection that when we're talking about Zen, like Zen Buddhism and doing Zazen, when you talk about Zazen, in Japanese, you are basically saying seated jhana, <laughs> seated dhyana. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Or again, that's going to be the first topic, which is what is this first jhana? Now, you all probably know, but just for the record, there are traditionally, technically, four jhanas, 
four geonic states. <clears throat> and tonight we're only going to talk about the first because that's all Mahakotahita is asked about is what's the first jhana. So let's read the answer and then we'll go through it. So again, the question is, friend, what is the first jhana? The answer, here, friend, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure, born of seclusion. This is called the first jhana. And then the next question that's related to this, which we won't go through right now, is, and how many factors, how many aspects are there to the first jhana? So, let me begin actually with this. So, there's a lot of uh, a lot of different ideas out there, of course, about what a jhana is. Like, what is it to be in a jhana? So, I be, before I even launch into this, I want to acknowledge there's a lot of different ways to understand this. The way that I understand it goes like this. So the answer to what is a jhana, it, it has these factors, these uh, anga, uh, limbs is would be the word, This these pancha anga, these five limbs or these five aspects. So the first is to be in a jhana is to be quite secluded from sensual pleasures, from kama. Now, that's the first one. And what I want to kind of remind you of is, is that the topic before this is about bhava, and that's either being a being of the realm of desire or a being of the realm of form or even a being of the formless realm. So those were the three options for bhava. And I kind of talked about this last week, but I want to say a little bit more about it. So what we kind of need to understand is that this bhava, this essence, or this being, what I basically want to point at is and this is what I talked about last week, let's take the body, your body. And what I mentioned last week was that there's one state of mind you could be in where you're kind of like looking in the mirror and you're judging how you look <laughs> compared to other people. And, and of course, I'm talking about the idea of like, being beautiful or thinking you're not beautiful or handsome or whatever. And what I'm getting at is, is that there's a way of relating to the body. There's a way of relating to the whole world, but specifically I'm talking about the body. And what I'm getting at is that there's a way in which you have a body of the realm of desire. And it's not actually the same body as the body of form. They're related, but they're actually two different bodies. And it really depends upon how you're relating to your body in that way or to the body in that way. And so again, what I mean is, is that if you're kind of obsessing or even you don't even have to be obsessing, but just thinking about the body in terms of desirability or lack of desirability, again, aesthetics, beauty, ugliness, all of that, that's one body. And we often spend a decent amount of time 
in that body, thinking about that body. But meditation, Buddhist meditation, is actually about transcending the realm of desire, transcending the kamadhatu. And what happens is, is that if you are able to focus the mind, calm down mental activity, you could leave that realm of desire behind. And then you would basically, and they, they do use the language of being reborn in the realm of form. And now you're in your form body. And the form body, the form body is just the body of material form. It is incomparable to any other body <laughs> because if you were comparing your body to some other body, that would be in the realm of desire. But to just be present with the lump of flesh that is the body, however it is, with no judgment at all, just being in the body of form, that is a different bhava, a different essence. And that is being, again, being reborn in the realm of form. Now, basically what I'm kind of clarifying is that when the definition of a jhana is that here, one is quite secluded from kama, quite secluded from sensual pleasures. That, that means you're not in the realm of desire. You're, you, you don't need to be, you have no desire to be looking at anything or listening to anything or smelling anything or tasting anything or touching anything. And actually, you're not even really interested in thinking about anything. There will be thought, but you're actually interested in not thinking for a moment. So, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, again, what that means is, is that we are not entertaining the five senses. Also, secluded from unwholesome states. Let's remember from Dharmador's past that when we talk about unwholesome states, we're talking about morality, shila. We're talking about the precepts. So we're talking about things like being violent, killing, stealing, being deceptive, being harsh with one's speech. All of that is unwholesome stuff. The practitioner here is quite secluded from all of that. And by the way, I think we are to understand that in order to get into the first jhana, you, in a way, need to have purified oneself. And what I mean by that is you need to have abstained from violence and killing for a little while. You need to have abstained from taking what has not been given, abstaining from lying. And there's a way in which if you abstain from those things, the mind becomes purified of those things. And that's the idea of being secluded from unwholesome states. And so if those two criteria are met, seclusion from the world of desire and seclusion from unwholesome states, then a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is, at a, which is accompanied by vitarka and vichaya. So is accompanied by what they translate as applied and sustained thought. So those are the next two factors involved in the first jhana. So the first two factors are seclusion from desire and seclusion from unwholesome states. And then the second is that the meditator is or is with or is doing vitarka and vichaya. 
So these are technical words. I've spent a, I spent a whole Dharma doors one night just talking about these two, but it's kind of re worth repeating. So basically, I mean, there's a lot of functioning to the mind. Buddhism, as you know, is a very psychologically oriented tradition, but there's two like really general modes of mental activity. One general mode of mental activity is called vitarka, and vitarka is looking around, investigating, uh, keeping an eye out. <laughs> That's vitarka. And there's a number of different things that you could be keeping an eye out for, but the general idea is that you are kind of observing your mind, you're observing the body, but you're observing yourself in that way, and you're noticing things arising, emotions arising, um, you know, again, thoughts arising. But my point is, is that one mode of mind is a kind of looking around, and then, so that's vitarka. And then let's say you noticed the arising of irritability, vipada, a kind of bitter resentment. You kind of get mad about something. So the vitarka is looking around and then notices the arising of this kind of, you know, again, little negative mind state. Now we would switch to vichaya where we are observing that emotion or we are observing that thought that has arisen. And so vichaya is when you're like locked in. We would probably translate this as focus where you are attending to a meditative object versus again, vitarka is where you're kind of looking around for a meditative object in that way. So those are these two modes of mental activity. And in the first jhana, the meditator is doing both, meaning the meditator is on the lookout so they are their the, their mind is active they're on the lookout and then once something arises they lock in on that and focus on that and that again is the vichaya so seclusion from desire seclusion from unwholesome states the mind's looking around the mind locks into a, a meditative object like an emotion or like a thought or something like that. And the idea is to stay with it until it either subsides or the attention is moved to something else. And then we're focusing on that. <clears throat> and then also in this first jhana, there is rapture called pity. And there is pleasure, sukha. And these rapture and pleasure, piti and sukha, are born of seclusion. And this is called the first jhana. So, and then let me just kind of conclude the, the paragraph and then we'll chat. So, the follow-up question to this was, friend, how many factors, how many aspects are there to the first jhana? And Maha, uh, or Shariputra replies, friend, the first jhana that we're talking about has five factors. Here, when a bhikkhu has entered upon the first jhana, there occur applied thought, vitarka, Sustained thought, vichaya, rapture, pitti, pleasure, sukha, and 
Chitta Ekyagata, unification of mind. That is how the first jhana has these five factors. And then real quick, friend, how many factors are abandoned in the first jhana and how many factors are possessed? Friend, in the first jhana, five factors, five things are abandoned and five things are possessed. Here, when a bhikkhu has entered upon the first jhana, sensual desire is abandoned, ill will is abandoned, sloth and torpor are abandoned, restlessness and remorse or restlessness and worry are abandoned, and doubt is abandoned. And there occur applied thought, sustained thought, rapture, pleasure, and unification of mind. That's how in the first jhana, five factors are abandoned and five factors are possessed. All right. So the, the last part of that, or we have two more things to talk about, but oneness of mind, that idea of chitta ekyagata. So ekya means one, chitta, mind. So this kind of single pointed mind in that way. So this is definitely where a lot of, you know, different Dharma or meditation teachers are going to kind of branch off in terms of what does that mean? For me, like there's kind of levels to this. Like you could understand this at a very basic level or you could go deeper and deeper and deeper. At a very basic level, we want to basically understand that the kind of Buddhist meditation project it recognizes that a sort of like natural state, not in a good way, but a natural state of the mind is very like nervous, frankly, like very uh, can't sit still, easily distracted, and ultimately basically like the, the, the attention kind of usually just follows the loudest, brightest thing in that way. And so the way that you can think about it is you can basically think of a divided mind. And for me, a divided mind is divided, well, it's divided in terms of kind of thinking about like, Like, you know, things like wondering what other people are thinking of me or thinking, what I mean is, is like one thing we think about is outside. But then, of course, there's a lot of internal dialogue, too. So we're sort of split that way, where our mind is like here, but also over there. But then we're also radically divided or split in terms of thinking about the past, maybe often with regret, thinking about the future, often with anxiety and anticipation, and then being present and thinking about the present moment. But my point is, is that our mind can be divided temporally, where we've kind of got one foot in the past and one foot in the future and, you know, certain other part of us in the present, right? So the process of Buddhist meditation is about this vichaya, this focusing of the mind. And what that does is, is that it begins to allow you to stop thinking about the past, to stop thinking about the future, in some ways to even stop thinking about the present as being present and just sort of actually being, which is actually different than being in the present, if you look at it. So there's that kind of 
bringing it all together by getting rid of past, present, and even past, present, and future, definitely forgetting, or I should say not worrying about what is not right in front of you. If it's somewhere else, it's in your imagination. So a, a mind that is just right here, not in the past, not in the future, all of that. That is a mind that is getting more and more unified, more and more present. And this process, the process of removing oneself from sensual pleasures. Now, I want to remind you that if, you know, you could, you could go off to the furthest, most remote cave on the highest mountain. But if you're sitting there like dreaming and daydreaming about sensual pleasures, you are not secluded from sensual pleasures. So I want to make it clear that seclusion from sensual pleasures does not mean just physically removing oneself. So let's make clear that this is a process where, you know, normally the senses are pursuing delight. <laughs> and we want to eat good stuff and we want to listen to good music. We want to watch cool things and we want sensual pleasures in that way. So it's a process to seclude oneself from sensual pleasures. As I was saying before, the secluding oneself from unwholesome states might take a while like to get all of that out. But then with those two, like those two requisites, no more sensual pleasure, no more unwholesome states, then you can start applying your vitarka and your vichaya. And I didn't mention this earlier, so I'll mention it now. In terms of the vitarka, the looking around, we're not just looking around for anything. No, we are looking around in a wise Buddhist way. And what I mean by that is, is that let's say a you were meditating and you were trying to seclude yourself. You were trying to remove yourself from those sensual pleasures and those unwholesome states. And you notice this kind of uh, you know, dull pain that is uncomfortable. So your vitarka would notice this uncomfortable pain, but the contemplation about that is, a you know, it could be something along the lines of the Buddhist understanding of impermanence. And so observing that with the knowledge that it is impermanent, that it cannot last because nothing lasts in that way. And so there is this process. I keep coming back to this idea. It's, this is, as far as I understand it, it's not like uh, jhana off, jhana on. <laughs> it's a slow process of removing oneself from these other things, applying the mind, in a very directed way, then doing that vichaya to really focus the mind. And if you do all of this, there can arise, and actually you will know that you're in a jhana when pity and sukha arise. But so pity, pity, you know, it's it's translated as rapture. So pity is feeling really good. Sukha. Sukha is the exact opposite of dukkha. We need to remember that dukkha is the suffering. Sukha is the bliss. Sukha is not suffering. So what I'm getting at is, is that there can reach a point in your meditation where 
you become very joyful, feeling very good in the body, feeling very kind of, again, rapturous and very sukha, very pleasurable. But what it is, though, is that this pleasure, this sukha, is born of seclusion. And what we want to notice is, is that normally we human beings, we get pleasure and delight from eating things, from looking at things, from listening to things. And often if we are deprived of those things, we get bored, we get restless, we, you know, we want that stuff, but through the proper meditative training, there can reach a point where you are joyfully blissful from not getting any sensual pleasures. It, what I'm getting at is, is that the, the kind of the quiet and the stillness of a good meditation all of a sudden becomes far more pleasurable than any sensual pleasure. That's a major moment in the life of a meditator. When I know that it happened, it happened for me when it was that fur, it happened a long time ago, but it was that first time when not only was I what not only was I not like waiting for the bell to go off, where I was like, you know, usually. I was like, ring the bell, ring the bell, ring the bell, like get me out of this meditative state. But I knew that I had made it into a jhana, the first jhana, and I knew I had made a tremendous amount of progress when they rang the bell. And I was like, ah, like I, my, my emotions were literally like, no, don't take that away. That's how my, that's how my understanding of that idea of rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. So, and then if you achieve such a state, then five things are abandoned. Five things are let go of, and they are the five nivaranya. So the five hindrances, the five coverings, this, this is, Sensual desire, ill will, laziness, anxiety, and doubt. So that's those are my translations of the five hindrances. I've done whole Dharma talks. We've done whole nights on the five hindrances. So we won't go into them now. I do just want you to kind of be thinking about, though, these five hindrances. These are five things that are holding you back. And from a Buddhist point of view, desire for those sensual pleasures is holding you back. Now, I want to remind everybody, I, I do this every time that I bring this up, but I just want to always want to make this really clear. When we're talking about this kind of desire, or craving for sensual pleasures, I, at least, I am not talking about the enjoyment of a sensual pleasure. What I mean is, I, I use the example that if somebody had, uh, I don't know, a little bag of goodies, and they were like, ooh, like these are so good. And then they were like, you want one? You want to try one? Well, if if somebody's offering a gift, it wouldn't be very nice to refuse that gift, right? So, sure, I'll try one and you're eating it and it's delicious. That's great. And I'm as far as I'm concerned, there's no problem with that. The problem though is when you're sitting there going like, oh, I really wish I could have another one of those. I don't think I could be happy until I have another one of those. <laughs> That's a whole other thing. 
So what I'm getting at is, is that the craving and the wanting of it is totally different than the enjoying of it. And I think it's really important to separate those two because too many times I've sort of run into, you know, that kind of Buddhist that's like, no, I shouldn't. Like when these things are kind of being offered as if Buddhism is about self sacrifice and about these things when it's not really not, it's really about that kind of, and I, I mentioned this a lot, but it's that, it's looking at the way in which if I'm sitting there thinking, I really want to have another one of those. I can't be happy until I have another one of those. You realize that that state of mind is putting you in this negative situation where you can't be happy until that is satisfied. And so you've put yourself in this compromised position to not be happy now <laughs> because you're holding out for this possibility or something. So the first of the hindrances is noticing that that kind of desire for greener grass, right? That idea that, oh, the grass is greener over there. So I can't be happy until I'm over there. That's a, that's a hindrance. So sensual desire, right? This uh, kamachanda, right? That's the first hindrance. Vyapada, ill will, bitterness, huge hindrance, of course. And then sloth and torpor, laziness is a hindrance. And then what they call restlessness and worry. That's the fourth of these hindrances. Anxiety. Huge hindrance for many of us. And then that fifth one is doubt. All right. Any questions about any of that? Anything Gianna related? Everybody doing okay with that? Cool. So let's move on to the next. So Maha Kutahita, their, their next question to Shariputra is friend. These five faculties, the five senses, each have a separate vishaya, a separate field of experience a separate domain, and they do not experience each other's field and domain. That is, the eye faculty, the ear faculty, the nose faculty, the tongue faculty, and the body faculty. Now, of these five faculties, each having a separate field, a separate domain, not experiencing each other's field and domain, <clears throat> What is their resort? What experiences their fields and domains? Friend, these five faculties each have a separate field, each have a separate domain, <clears throat> and they do not experience each other's field and domain. That is the eye faculty, ear, nose, tongue, and body faculty. Now these five faculties each having a separate field and a domain, have mind as their resort. And mind experiences their fields and domains. Friend, as to these five faculties, that is the eye, ear, nose, tongue, and body, what do these five faculties stand independence on. <clears throat> Friend, as to these five faculties, the eye, ear, nose, tongue, and body, these five faculties stand independence on vitality. And this vitality is ayu. Friend, 
What does vitality stand independence on? Vitality stands independence on ushma, heat. Well, friend, what does heat stand independence on? Heat stands independence on vitality. <laughs> Mahakotihita says, whoa, 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 hold up, friend. Just now, we understood the Venerable Sariputra to have said that vitality stands in dependence on heat. And now we understand him to say that heat stands in dependence on vitality. How should the meaning of that be regarded? In that case, friend, I shall give you a simile. For the wise can understand the meaning of statements by means of simile. Just like when an oil lamp is burning, its radiance is seen in dependence on its flame, and its flame is seen in dependence on its radiance. So too, Ayu, vitality, stands in dependence on Ushma, and Ushma, heat, stands in dependence on vitality. All right, so this is getting into some serious Abhidharma. Like, this is like super Abhidharma now. So the question is, regarding these faculties, the first question is, what is their resort? What experiences their fields and domain? Now, this is a pretty standard um, kind of Buddhist psychology, definitely of the Hinayana, the early school. And basically the what you have is you have a kind of a view of the five senses, which is that they are operating kind of independently, but that they are all kind of hooked up, if you will, to the mano vijnana. So in case you are wondering, when it says that the five faculties have the mind as their resort, and by resort, they mean like what they go back to in that way. And if you were wondering, well, what, what word are they using for mind? It's not chitta, it's mano, mano vijnana. And this again is a kind of standard Buddhist psychology and the way that I think of this, or I should say the way that it was taught to me and the way that I then think of it, you can kind of think of it as, uh, and I probably, uh, I don't have a, a, my props with me, but you can imagine this one. I want you to imagine that I had a, a mirror. And what I want you to imagine is that I'm holding that mirror up here and I'm reflecting something that's over there and it's coming and so you can see it here in the mirror you can't actually see over there but you can see what's going on in the mirror well the way you can think about kind of the buddhist uh structure of the mind you can imagine your ears and your eyes and your nose and your tongue and your body as kind of being like mirrors. And those mirrors are reflecting in a way the phenomenal world. And all five mirrors are directed towards the central mirror of the mind. And thinking what we uh, experience as thinking is kind of like looking down into the mirror of the mano vijnana and being like, oh, look, there's knowing. Oh, look, there's my computer. Oh, look, there's that. But this is just getting the reflections from the five mirrors. And the important thing to remember about that is that these five mirrors they might be distorted, they might be warped, they might be dusty, they might be defiled. 
So they are reflecting and then a warped image goes to my mano vinyana, my mind consciousness. And then the mano vinyana might be warped. <laughs> the mano vinyana mirror might be defiled. So when you're looking at the world, don't think that what you're seeing and hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching is the world. It's your kind of version of it in that way. So that's the first part of this, where the answer is that the five faculties have the mano vinyana as, its, as their resort. And then <clears throat> the next question, what do these five faculties, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body, what do they stand in dependence on? And the answer is this vitality. So it's a long A, ah, why you, ah, you. Ah, you, I mean, I've been, I've been digging around Pali and Sanskrit dictionaries all day trying to find this ayu. You know, it sounds a lot like vayu, like wind, but it's not. The dictionary definitions of it are basically that it's a kind of vital life force energy. It's thus the translation vitality in that way. So this is definitely, you know, um, indicative of this early form of Buddhism. Not, you know, you, you don't actually hear this uh, biology or this anatomy. You don't actually always hear this in the Mahayana, but it's very much a part of the early tradition that the body and the sense faculties are sort of running on Ayu, they're running on this vital life force energy in that way. But then there's this other thing, ushma, heat. And the question is, okay, so the five faculties are dependent upon this vital life force energy, this ayu, but what is ayu dependent on? Well, this ushma or heat and then this weird thing where it's like, okay, what's the heat dependent on? The ayu. And that's where Maho Kotihita is like, wait a minute. How does that work? <laughs> but then this interesting simile. Just like an oil lamp that's burning, its radiance is seen in dependence on the flame. And its flame is seen on dependence on the radiance. I don't know if you've ever really stared at a candle flame and actually thought about that. And what it is, is it's, it's, it's really reflecting on like, how am I seeing the candle light? Because like you need light, right, to see things, right? So how do you see the light? <laughs> no, right. You need light to re to then light up things. So how how do you see the radiance? And it's actually really kind of subtle if you really start to think about it. And that's the Buddha's simile, that's the Buddha's analogy for how this Ushma and Ayu are in this kind of dance or this relationship together. I don't have a lot of answers about this, but any comments, questions? <laughs> Noe? It's similar as the reflection of the moon in a drop of water what is it dependent upon yeah. so that's what i kind of meant noe by 
this is like a very early form of Buddhism where everything is not so interdependent. In early Buddhism, there's much more of an idea of like causal dependencies. And this question of, well, what is that dependent upon? Well, what is that dependent upon? And then we get to this bottom where the two bottom ones are sort of back and forth, but it's not quite dependent origination. It's kind of something a little more different in that way. Um, I think actually, unless there's any, you know, comments, ideas, let's move to the next one, but then we'll kind of come back because the next one is actually, uh, I, I wanted to talk about it tonight. <clears throat> so this next one is about Ayu Samskara. So Ayu is that idea of vitality. And I know you know what samskara are, habits, conditioning. So this section is about conditioned vital life force energy. <clears throat> Friend, our Ayu samskara, so our vital habitual formations, things that can be felt or are conditioned vital formations one thing and things that can be felt another thing. Shariputra tells us vital conditioned formations, friend, are not things that can be felt. If vital formations were things that can be felt, then a bhikkhu who has entered upon the nirodha of samya and vedana. So a bhikkhu who has entered upon the cessation of perception and sensation, they would not be seen to emerge from it if they could feel ayu samskara. Because vital formations are one thing and things that can be felt are another, a bhikkhu who has entered upon the cessation of perception and feeling can be seen to emerge from it. But friend, when this body is bereft of how many states is it then discarded and forsaken, left lying senseless like a log? So Mahakotahita's question is, when is a body dead? So when is a body left lying senseless like a log? Shariputra says, friend, when this body is bereft of three states, ayu, vitality, ushma, heat, and vijnana, consciousness, it is then discarded and forsaken, left lying senseless like a log. Well, friend, What's the difference between one who is dead, one who has completed, his, meaning one who has passed away, completed their time, and a bhikkhu who has entered upon the cessation of perception and feeling? Well, friend, in the case of one who is dead, one who has completed their time, their bodily formations, their kaya samskara, their bodily formations have ceased and subsided. Their vachi samskara, their vocal conditioning, their vocal samskara have ceased and subsided. Their chitta samskara, their mental conditioning have ceased and subsided. Their ayu, their vitality is exhausted. Their ushma has been dissipated. And their indriya, their faculties, are fully broken up. But in the case of a bhikkhu who has entered upon the cessation of perception and feeling, their bodily formations have ceased and subsided. 
Their verbal formations have ceased and subsided. Their mental formations have ceased and subsided, but their vitality is not exhausted. Their heat is not dissipated and their faculties become exceptionally clear. This is the difference between one who is dead, who has completed their time, and a bhikkhu who has entered upon samya vedana nirodha, the cessation of perception and feeling. Okay. So on this note, um, I'm, 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 I'm sad that Gnome's not here anyways, but last week Gnome had a great question. And Noam's question was, Noam recognized that we'd already dealt with vinyana, we'd already dealt with vedana, samskara, or not samskara, but samnya. And so the question was, oh, this sounds like the five aggregates. But there was no samskara section. But notice that samskara came up a lot in this section. So I would kind of direct gnome to noticing that. So this is, and, and actually, um, before I forget, if anybody's interested in what we're about to talk about, which is this uh, cessation of perception and feeling, if anybody's interested in this, I really recommend this book called On Being Mindless, uh, Buddhist Meditation and the Mind-Body Problem. So this is an entire book on what we're about to talk about. And what it is, and it has, ex and it, it actually this book has a lot to do with this section that we just read. So what it is, and let me just kind of paraphrase this for you really quickly. And I want to remind you that there is this, uh, a progression that's happening in this sutra where we started with like, what's wisdom? What knows wisdom? What's jhana? What's the first jhana? Well, now we're at this really deep meditative state. This uh, samnya vedana nirodha, the cessation of samnya and the cessation of vedana. So I want to remind you that those are two of the aggregates, right? Samnya is perception. And let me remind you about perception. Perception is something like this. And I want you to notice that what's over here depends upon what you're perceiving. So perception is on you in that way. It's not just seeing what's there to be seen. Your perception is how you're boxing all of this up. Vedana, though. Vedana is, well, it's translated as feeling or sensation. It's not just of the body, though. We need to remember that whenever a sense organ, the eyes or the ears, nose, tongue, body, Whenever the sense organ comes into contact with its sense object, it creates a feeling or a sensation. The, the body reacts positively or negatively or neutrally, but normally the body reacts in terms of, ooh, give me more. That's called a pleasant vedana. Or the body reacts with, get that away from me meaning I want less of it. So Vedana is not like, I, I, I like to emphasize this. Vedana is not just like the, the raw sense experience. Vedana is about how you're reacting to it. Again, do you want more? Do you want less? Like that's Vedana. So there is a very deep meditative state. It's what's being referred to here. And it's a meditative state in which perception and Vedana 
cease. They, they come to what is called nirodha, cessation. So the point is, is that to have a cessation of vedana means you're not reacting to the sensations. You're observing them, but you're not reacting to them. But then there's also the cessation of perception along with this. And so you're not even perceiving the object to react to it. Now, the question here, by the way, the question here about these ayu samskara, the these, so we've we've already been told about this vitality, this ayu this vital life force energy. But now, Sariputra tells us that there's an Ayu Samskara. By the way, in this same paragraph, we are also told about Kaya Samskara, bodily habits, bodily conditioning. You, you know what is a major Kaya Samskara? Breathing. Breathing is one of the main bodily habits. You do not think about breathing. It is a habit. It just happens. So it's a body samskara. And what they're talking about here is an ayu samskara. A habit of living in a way. And now the question is, regarding this habit of like being alive, the question is, can, can you feel that? Are vital conditioned formations things that can be felt or not? And the answer is no. You can't feel ayu samskara. Now, the important thing about this, like uh, dharmically speaking, what they're saying is, is that if you could feel them, there would be something to be aware of. And then that would not be samya vedana nirodha. So, but then this is the big question. And by the way, the, the, the big question that this book is interested in answering, it's so interesting. So if I really shut this whole operation down, so I mean that I bring it all down to stillness, and I want to remind you that when the question gets raised, what's the difference between a dead person and somebody in this cessation of perception and feeling uh, meditation, like what's the difference? Notice that what they both have in common is that bodily, vocal, and mental samskara have all ceased and subsided. What that means is technically a meditator that gets into this state stops breathing. They stop heartbeat. It's why they're asking this question of what's the difference between a corpse and a meditator that's in this deep meditation? Because they sound like they're almost exactly the same. If, if the meditator isn't breathing, has no heartbeat, is basically in a state of, of suspended animation, What's the difference? The difference is that the meditator still has ayu samskara, ushma samskara, and vinyana, or, or some sort of mental activity. This idea that the, the faculties become exceptionally clear, which I want to talk about that before we uh, depart tonight. So the question 
that this book is interested in answering. If you shut this whole thing down and you shut the mental uh, faculty down so that karma, karmic production has been brought to cessation, how do you get out of that state? Karmically speaking, this is a conundrum because, you know, action, reaction. You got to like do something to then cause something else in that way. So if you brought it all to stillness, what can cause it to come back online? Well, according to this book and according to this sutra, and I'm sure this book references this sutra or sutras like it, what it's saying is, is that there's this life force, this vital life force habit that is there and you can't feel it, which is why you can have cessation of perception and feeling, but it's still there. And it's that habit of vitality that basically knocks you out of Nirodha and then back into a conscious state. No. <laughs> like uh, sleeping. Sleeping. Uh, uh. The excellent, excellent, Noe, the example that's given in the Abhidharma, and it's the example that is used in this book, is waking up from sleep, which is that you don't consciously, like, you're. it's not like you're in the middle of the dream and you're like, all right, I'm going to wake up now. I mean, you know, it, I know it happens sometimes, but the idea is, is that you, oh, and... It came up in a sutra a couple of weeks ago. I don't remember the context in which it came up, but there was a reference to a meditator being able to basically set an internal alarm clock where they could get up when they wanted to get up. Well, there's a, the same exact thing happens, which is that if, if a meditator is going to go into the uh, Samya Vedana Nirodha, if they're going to go into that cessation of perception and feeling meditation, they have to set the intention beforehand that, okay, I'm going to stay in there for two days. Or, But they have to set that intention to come out of it. And then the intention's there. Then they can get into the meditative state and then get knocked out of it. Noe. Yes. Uh, could you say the title of the book and the author again? The title of the book is On Being Mindless by Paul Griffiths. Uh, yeah. Excellent book. Uh, if you're interested in this kind of more technical aspects of meditation in the mind, it's one of the best. Robin. Thank you. Um, this is kind of interesting. Um, I was reading that Descartes' uh, cognito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. Um, um, somewhat of, of the ag agitar, uh, that agitar to agitate is um, is sort of the basis of that word. And so sort of the shaking up, to shake things up, therefore I am. Hmm. And so if one quits shaking that snow globe and everything settles, is there an I am? Is there, uh, 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 so what is 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 left there? Um. Well, regarding that, Let's actually, because we didn't, we haven't talked about it tonight, regarding that idea, so I, I've probably mentioned this a long time ago, but so a Buddhist response to the Cartesian maxim of cogito ergo sum, 
the Buddhist response to that is about the presumption that I'm thinking. And we've talked about this uh, many times. The Buddhist, like the idea of no self, like this really, really essential teaching of Buddhism is about the delusion that I'm thinking versus there being thinking going on. And, and I, it can sound semantic, but it's not. It's actually really looking at the idea of I'm thinking. And then it's like, wait a minute. Am I thinking? Can I really just think whatever I want to think at any moment? Is that really what's going on here? Or are thoughts bubbling up and there's experience happening? And then there's the thought that it must be happening to somebody. And so the idea is, and by the way, um, well, I won't get too into the critique of Descartes. We don't need to critique Descartes too much, but it is that idea in Buddhism that there is mental activity, of course, but the presumption that there's somebody doing it, that's actually what, that's a defilement of the mind that could be cleared away by all of this that we're talking about. Yeah. Oh, good. Excellent. Any other comments or ideas, questions? All right. So one last point to make. In this section, where it was talking about, um, so in the last part of this, it said, in the case of a bhikkhu who's entered upon the cessation of perception and feeling, their bodily habitual conditioning has ceased. Their verbal, which by the way, when it says verbal or uh, vachi samskara, this idea of verbal conditioning, this is not just about the uh, habit of talking and then silence being the cessation of verbal samskara. That internal dialogue that is happening in the language that you speak like if you are an English speaker, you're probably having an English internal dialogue. Well, that's still vocal karma. It's like language karma. But in a meditator, that has ceased as well. So there's no more kind of yapping of an internal dialogue. And then mental. Now, this would be more of like emotions and things like that. So all three some scutta, all three types of conditioning have subsided. But the vitality thing, the heat, have they're they're still there. They have not disappeared, they haven't been dissipated. And then a corpse, if you'll remember, it says that a dead person or a corpse, their faculties are all broken up. But for a meditator, their faculties become exceptionally clear. Now, what I want to talk about, the language of the, the faculties becoming exceptionally clear. So the I, I did this for a reason. So the analogy that is used to talk about this, the analogy is a mirror. And they talk about putting a mirror at a busy, dusty crossroads. And they talk about that mirror getting covered with dirt and filth and all of that at the busy crossroads of life. Then they talk about taking a mirror and polishing it and polishing it until it is like perfectly clear and then putting it in a box. <laughs> and the idea is, is that 
that the surface of that mirror is like perfectly clear it and I, what i want you to think about you might be asking like why is it in a box what we're thinking about at that mirror that's at the the dusty crossroads of life not only do we want to be thinking about the mirror and like you know like the dust from the street or the dust from the road getting on it but we also want to be thinking about looking in that mirror at the crossroads and seeing just all that. Now take that mirror, wipe off all the dust, get it perfectly clear, put it in a dark box and think about the surface of that mirror. Like think about how still and inactive it is. That's what's being referred to where the five faculties become exceptionally clear. And what I want you to notice is that we've done a great deal or we've talked about a great deal of sensory deprivation, pulling away from all of that. And so they do describe the mirror of the mind and the mirror of the mind is often standing at the dusty crossroads of life, just getting dusty and getting, you know, all of this mental activity. The meditation process that we've been talking about tonight in terms of seclusion from the senses and then even bringing perception and feeling to cessation that's putting the mind, the mirror of the mind in this very still space in that way. Questions about that? <laughs> All right. So um, we are going to pause there because the last section is a very kind of long section about the fourth jhana. And there's so much good information in here that I think we're going to spend all of next Sunday night just going through this because there's, again, there's just a lot of important information in here. So we're going to spend one more night on this. There's a lot of interesting meditations in the last part. So stay tuned for that. <laughs>